Support for this podcast is provided by Avalara. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes. And their solutions are designed to affordably scale with businesses as they grow. Collecting tax for the government is something businesses just have to do. But getting the job done efficiently and correctly can be an incredible challenge because tax rules and regulations can be endlessly complicated. Avalara keeps track of how thousands upon thousands of products are taxed in more than 13,000 tax jurisdictions, and that's just in the United States. With more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point of sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash tax notes. That's avalara.com slash tax notes. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the state of the IRS. April 18th will mark the end of the third tax filing season since the start of the pandemic. This season has seen continued challenges for the IRS with a backlog of millions of paper returns and difficulty staffing the phone lines. But with a recent increase in the IRS budget and streamlined hiring process, are things starting to improve? To answer these questions and more, tax analyst, president, and CEO Kara Griffith spoke with IRS Commissioner Charles Reddig on our monthly webinar series, Taxing Issues. What you'll be hearing shortly is an abridged version of their discussion that took place remotely. We'll link to the full interview in the show notes. So joining me now is Kara Griffith, the host of the Taxing Issues webinar series. Kara, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me today. All right, to start off, could you tell us a bit about the Taxing Issues series? Absolutely. We have really enjoyed doing the Taxing Issues webinar series. We started it a couple of years ago, and it was the fallout of the pandemic, largely, that we had planned an in-person event to celebrate Tax Analyst's 50th anniversary. And when we couldn't do that, we pivoted and we started a webinar series. Taxing Issues is a monthly webinar that we host uh, on a variety of tax issues, federal, state, international, and sometimes we will even branch out beyond that. We've had some policy. We've had a lot of tremendous guests on, and it has been a lot of fun to hear from different people. One of the great benefits of having this as a webinar, as opposed to having an in-person event, is that we've had the ability to get guests that we might not have otherwise been able to talk to. And it's really enabled us to broaden our horizons and to bring people to the tax analysts and the taxing issues fan base now that they would otherwise not have heard. So could you give us a preview of the interview we're about to hear? Absolutely. The interview with Commissioner Redding was a lot of fun. It was fascinating. And I think that the commissioner did a tremendous job of showing the human side of the IRS. He definitely acknowledged that there have been a lot of challenges that the IRS has faced in the past couple of years which has gone right into the tax season this year. The IRS has a huge backlog of unprocessed paper returns, and it is struggling to get through them. The commissioner was very forthcoming uh, with the struggles that the IRS is facing, but was also very optimistic that that backlog is going to be cleared by the end of the calendar year. He also went on to talk about the technology improvements that the IRS is looking to make and a lot of the challenges that they are facing with the lack of resources that the IRS has seen in probably the last decade. I hope that everyone enjoys it. The commissioner was personable and he was funny and uh, and he really gave a good inside look at what's going on at the IRS. All right, let's go to that interview. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kara Griffith, the president and CEO of Tax Analysts. Now, our guest today needs no introduction, but it would be very impolite of me if I didn't give him one. As the 49th IRS commissioner, Mr. Reddick entered the service as a known commodity with more than 36 years in private practice, representing taxpayers in both civil and criminal matters. Now, of course, during his long tenure in private practice, I would say he reached the height of his career when he wrote pieces of commentary for tax notes (laughs) back in like 2010, 2011. And in his time as commissioner, Mr. Ruddick has shown that he believes deeply in the importance of the IRS's work and the strength of its people. So we've got a lot to discuss today, and I want to thank the commissioner for taking time out of his very busy schedule to be here. So let's get started. Commissioner, it's almost tax day. How is the filing season going so far, and, and could you give us sort of a general state of affairs at the IRS? 
Yeah, and it's, um, first, let me say, Kara, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when I was on the outside, it was a pleasure to be able to write what I thought at least and, and uh, others, timely articles. And frequently, if I was writing something, it was something I picked up, you know, from practice, being out and about, whether it's at conferences or otherwise. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm a tax guy, and I always introduce myself as a tax guy in the professional environment. Um, to me, in tax, what somebody's credentials are is, is only part of it, but basically, you know, tax, tax administration, whether it's from the private sector or the government sector, it's important for the country. And, you know, what we've faced at the Internal Revenue Service, certainly during the pandemic, um, I think has been important for the country. And also, I, I would be the first to say as a tax guy with 36 years experience with a wife who is a, a tax preparer, uh, she's in the tax department of a business management firm, has been anything but user friendly for tax professionals. And uh, that's not lost on anybody at the IRS, including myself. Like everyone else, the pandemic hit us hard and continues to hit us hard. Um, I, can, I will say today, and I'll say you know, after my term expires, uh, I think we gave it our best. It's very clear and it's easy to say we didn't always get it right, but I would tell you that we tried our best and there's a lot of limitations. I'm not somebody typically who says, well, we didn't have funding, well, we didn't have staffing, well, we didn't have uh, this, or we had the pandemic. And you know, my comments inside the IRS have been from day one, when COVID first started to, to surface, we have to operate. We don't have a choice to sort of sit back, wait and see what's gonna happen and sort of weather the storm, if you will. Everybody in the country is relying on us in, in what, from one perspective of another or another. So um, the pandemic has been difficult for us, but not more difficult than it's been difficult for folks in the private sector. Uh, the one issue that we needed to deal with is we were not um, able to operate in a virtual environment in February and March of 2020. Today, we are able to operate in a virtual environment. Very proud of of the government and certainly the people at IRS and, and a lot of folks who helped us. And, you know, we use a lot of contractors as well of the pivot that we did in March, April of 2020 into a virtual environment. And again, I'll be the first to say from the private sector side, it might not be as noticeable. And, you know, a lot of people can say, well, geez, IRS, you're not answering calls or you're not this or you had the mail. If you look at it from our side, every effort was made by every person at the IRS to lessen the impact on tax professionals as well as taxpayers. Uh, we shut down in March of 2020. And recently I've been getting questions, well, when is IRS gonna come back into the office? Uh, we've been in the office since March of 2020. We operate in a obviously socially distanced environment. So in March of 2020, our CSRs who are the folks that answer the phones only 3% were telework eligible. By the summer of 2020, 100% of them were telework eligible. And those would be the people who answer the phones. And so your next question might be, well, then how come, you know, every time I call, I can't get an answer? And you can't get an answer because during the pandemic, we were receiving at various points in time, we received between four and 600% of the highest volume of calls the IRS has ever received in history. And at various points, we were receiving phone calls at the rate of 1,500 per second. We had about 15 or 16,000 people total who could answer those calls. Uh, through COVID funding, we were able to onboard an additional thousand. And that doesn't sound like a lot in terms of 1,500 calls per second, by the way, I think it's per minute, but it's per second, um, or maybe in terms of two or 300 million calls. But I will tell you, every one of those folks is critical to us and critical to you. You know, the, the people in this country deserve to have an IRS that answers the phone when people call, that responds when people reach in, that, it, that you can walk in and interact with people. And um, I hope to give you no excuses, but an understanding of where the IRS was, where it is, and certainly where it's going forward um, from here, that the challenges that we've faced, we had short-term challenges, which are pretty obvious today, inventories and, and phones, level of service and such, and hiring is, is another short-term challenge. The long-term challenges are funding. And I you know, interacted with the IRS from the outside for forever, my entire professional career. This agency should have been modernized 10 years before I came on board. And it's, it's unacceptable for the stage it's in today. And it's unacceptable for the agency to go forward 
without being a really state-of-the-art modern agency. I mean, it's the, um, you know, it, it, we touch more Americans than any organization on the planet, public or private sector, that um, we are, uh, I think fiscal 21, our gross revenue was $4.1 trillion. That translates into about 95 or 96% of the gross revenue of the country. And during the pandemic, we were the front line for the US government. We, um, we were the people who talked to people who you know, were holed up in their home for this or that. And maybe people called with respect to trying to get an economic impact payment or such, or a tax related issue. But I will tell you, once they got on the phone with us, those calls very rapidly switched to people telling us their life story, the impact of the pandemic. You know, they lost a spouse, they lost a neighbor and things like that. And so one area that you may not be supportive of, but I'm gonna tell you that what we did was, I told our people to stay on the phone, right? We are the only people who are touching people in that scenario. Stay on the phone, interact with them as a person because people in this country were going through something they had never gone through before. None of us had ever gone through before. Let people talk about their family, their this or that. So that raised our average call time by about four minutes in, in, in the average. Some obviously would be longer and some would be shorter, but the average went up about four minutes. But when you look at the volume we're trying to deal with, that impacted the ability of the IRS people to answer a lot of other calls. But we were trying to take care of the people who we could take care of, who we answered the phones for, and let them know that somebody cares. That's a terrific setup for the rest of the discussion. And that was a very human approach for the IRS to take. I, I did not realize yeah. that. But the IRS is often put in the position where it is asked to do additional tasks above and beyond what would be its normal return processing tasks and, uh, and does somehow muddle through. So let's get to the one of the biggest questions that I think is on the minds of everyone, and that is the, the backlog. So we've, we've been through um, we've been through the pandemic. We are where we are. Um, is it realistic to think that you can get through the backlog of unprocessed returns um, in a, in a, by the end of the year? Is that, a, is that a realistic expectation? You know, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be challenges that we don't yet know about that will happen. Um, and if you can't, then what is, what's the backup to that? So let me tell you that uh, Chuck Reddick and Commissioner Chuck Reddick both are committed that we are going to be healthy by the end of um, the calendar year 22. So December 31, 22, we talk in terms of before we go into filing season 23 and you have my commitment on that. We are not operating on, well, there's 39 weeks, we can process you know, this many per week, therefore we do that many per week and we go home. Uh, we have done everything we can to process as quickly as we can. We have tried things that a very risk averse agency never would have considered two years ago. And we are looking to, my terminology is crush this inventory as quickly as possible. And so if we finish up early, uh, you're not going to see us pat ourselves on the back because I would be the first to say we probably should have finished up early last year, but our volumes were significantly larger last year than they are this year. What we're seeing, things that we've done um, you know, in the last six months, so the last quarter of last year and the first quarter of this year have had a significant impact on where we are and where we're headed. And when you see IRS folks use the terminology about getting back to healthy, healthy is in the eyes of the taxpayer and the tax practitioner, you know, tax professional. It's not in the eyes of the IRS. You know, healthy for us is to run on sort of a stable level stable system support for this podcast is provided by SafeSend. empower staff with tax automation software that is transforming the accounting profession the safe send suite improves your firm's processes from engagement letters and client organizers to assembly delivery and e-signing of tax packages the safe send suite makes it easy clients love the intuitive consistent experience at every step of the tax engagement Staff love reducing the time they spend on manual labor-intensive tasks. Schedule a demo at safesend.com to see it in action. That's safesend.com. Where are we currently? I'm going to throw out a couple of numbers with, with respect to current filing season and then some backlog numbers that are really current as of uh, this or last week. So some volumes, unprocessed paper returns. Paper is the item that's got the IRS on its heels. We received last year almost 17 million paper returns. 
as you know, for, for what seems like ever, the government has been saying electronically file, electronically file. We came into filing season 22, the current filing season, really pushing buttons to say e-file, request direct deposit, make sure you have an accurate return. And to get an accurate return, we sent out 200 million reconciliation letters on the EIP payments that people received. Another 57 million reconciliation letters in the advanced child tax credit arena on the amount of payments they received. People received either six or seven of those payments during the last half of last year. So in total, we sent out 257 million letters saying, hey, this is how much you got. We also said you can get an online account and you can check in your online account to see how much you got. Well, why would we put all that effort in there? Well, last year we had more than 10 million returns where people were unable to reconcile two economic impact payments. And we knew this year we're coming into an economic impact payment and advanced child tax credit payment. So the idea was get as much information in the hands of the tax professional and the taxpayer if they're gonna go it on their own <clears throat> to be able to reconcile that. So we sent out 257 million payments. I interacted with um, one large transmitter very early in this year when I heard that um, they, were, they were basically advising their franchisees to start collecting and, and sending returns in on January 4. We opened on January 24. And basically I touched base and said, you know, we need you, your people who are preparing the returns to reconcile these numbers. We cannot get tens of millions of returns again where those numbers aren't right because even an e-file return, if those figures don't match what we have, they, the filters kick them out and they go into a manual processing environment. A manual processing environment, we got had almost 30 million returns that had to be manually processed with respect to reconciliation of economic impact payments, with respect to the um, unemployment compensation, you know, the 10,200 being an exclusion, and with respect to the look back, people who for earned income tax credits and certain other things could use their 2019 income instead of their 2020 income as a basis and basically in theory their 19 income was higher so they would get a higher EIP. The 10,200 and the look back happened while we were already in filing season. And um, once we program our systems, we cannot go back in and during filing season and reprogram without seriously jeopardizing filing season, which means we don't go back in. And so all of that had to happen manually. Where we are now, Unprocessed paper returns is the current figure for, for individuals. Returns that we received during calendar year uh, 21, we have 2.4 million left. Not that long ago, I was giving out numbers of eight to 10 million. So 2.4 million sounds like a lot. Those are paper returns received in calendar year 21, 2.4 million. Paper returns received in cal calendar year 22 is another 2.5 million. Those are not necessarily out of date. We are in filing season 22, but the paper returns that we have to process the total there for 1040s right now is 4.9 million returns. A big issue for a lot in the tax community, 1040X during filing season 22, um, we have 2.6 million amended returns in process. 1.6 million of those are over in the, what we call a submission processing side of the house, which generally speaking will be the less complex 1040Xs, and 917,000 are in our accounts management side of the house, which will be the more complex ones. So why am I telling you that? Because you're about to hear that we've, we're doing a huge shift of 1040Xs from submission processing side over to accounts management, because the accounts management folks are well ahead of the curve in processing 1040Xs. That's a good sign. So you know, everything I'm trying to identify here for you is we're trending in a really positive direction. People concerned about um, uh, retention credit, we have uh, 317,941 Xs and 1.8 million 941s. Those are being handled on an expedited basis to allow people to file the current return. But the last statistic I'll give you is unopened mail because I get a lot of inbounds, whether it's from the Hill or from others of IRS has this mail backlog. We have been current on our mail for many months. We had 23 million pieces of unopened mail in July of 2020. This week, we have 381,000 pieces of mail unopened, but that's current. 
Every week we receive between one and one and a half million pieces of mail and we process one to one and a half million pieces of mail. So mail, unopened mail in the three to 400,000 range is, is typical, it's not unusual. Um, you know, like in private practice, I never finished my last case. I always had an inventory of other cases. This is the same thing here in mail. So opening and sorting, by the way, the mail, getting it into the right channel, getting it out to the right folks, um, we are current. So mail is something that we have, um, if you will, overcome. Well, why can't we just go out and hire 10,000 more people and put them on the phones tomorrow? The IRS has a unique accounting system, which I refer to as buckets, and we get appropriated funds. And in significant, what we got hit with here, we get X amount of dollars to put Y number of people on the telephones. And that figure is determined two years before the year. For example, we're right now, um, our budget work is being done with respect to the 23 year. And we're actually programming filing season 23 now while we're in 22. So we always have that going on. So when you when the, your base year was a non-pandemic year and then you have two years of pandemic, the math doesn't work. What we were able to get in COVID was specific funding for another thousand employees. But know that I couldn't take a thousand employees or FTEs as they call it, you know, the dollar value and move it onto the phones and be impactful. So we had to come at it from other directions. Why do I believe that we're going to be able to get through this? March 15 of this year, we got our budget. Uh, we got it last year, by the way, March 11. Why am I telling you March 11 and March 15? Which means that we went half of each year on what's known as a continuing resolution, which says IRS operate on your prior fiscal year um, enacted budget, right? So we get our budget halfway into the year to know what our annual budget is. I basically get six months to figure out how to spend the money they give us let's say in the IT world for technology. If we can't spend it, it goes back. It's one year money, not two year money. So we get the money and we try to do it, but the start stop, and this goes back you know, 10 years, the start stop on the funding is, is just death for any organization, let alone the IRS, to be able to build out a robust IT infrastructure. And had this infrastructure been um, built out, designed, implemented, et cetera, 10 years ago, we would have been answering those phone calls. We would have been processing that mail, right? In a more timely manner. Instead, we're somewhat caught on our heels. So you'll hear people at IRS talk a lot about um, continuing resolutions, CRs. There have been more than 100 CRs since tax year 2001. Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And it's not unique to the IRS, but the IRS is the one that's kind of behind the curve trying to do this. What we got on March 15. Congress rescued us. I testified last week, Senate Finance Committee. It can't be more clear. Congress rescued us with not only a budget. They gave us direct hiring authority. And what that means is for submission processing accounts manager, what that means, we can hold a job fair. And we started our job fairs. We got that authority on March 15. We started holding our job fairs in Kansas City, Ogden, and Austin when we did on a rotating basis. In-person job fairs. People come out uh, starting March 16th. We have brought on board more than 2,500 people in the last two weeks of March. And as an example, in Austin, we held a job fair. 500 people showed up with resumes. 500 people got uh, job offers. We're way over 90% on offers for people who show up in person. We're also holding job fairs virtually. It's a lower percentage because they need to follow up. But the critical thing is to offer somebody a job and get them in our doors within 30 to 45 days. That is significant in terms of going forward. So those types of matters make a big difference. The one thing I think that there was a recurring theme throughout what you were saying on, on the use of technology and that technology is going to be really important to a modern IRS um, and for the ability of the IRS to serve taxpayers. Um, and it sounds, and as you're talking about chatbots and, and things like that, and one question that I, I was kind of thinking throughout was whether the IRS is looking at different types of AI and machine learning in order to improve processes. I know, you know, most businesses are, even tax analysts is considering how can we take some of the human nature out of identifying a code section in a, in a story and having a computer linked to it so that we can have humans doing other 
um, more sensitive, arguably maybe more important type of things. So what is the technology future for the IRS and, and where do you see it going um, and, and how can that then lend to better taxpayer service? So technology is critical for the IRS to get to the their point, to get people the service that they deserve. We have the greatest country in the world. We should be, in, and we have the greatest, you know, IT folks, right? The tech companies are here. They're founded here. They stay here. Um, and it's really a lot of what people have to interact with, with all federal agencies, not just the IRS, is really unacceptable when you wrap it with the United States of America. We should be the lead, right? We should be the ones that people go, you know, IRS has this. And unfortunately, we're not. And uh, so in 2019, uh, April 16, 2019, we launched our business modernization plan, a six-year plan, 2.3 to $2.7 billion to quote-unquote modernize, to bring present-day technology into the IRS. $2.7 billion might sound like a lot of money, but at the same exact time that we announced that, two of the large banks announced that they were spending 12 to $14 billion a year for five years to do what we're trying to do for $2.7 billion. That's the difference between private sector and government, big private sector, right? Yeah. And then also, um, you know, we, we really have to scramble for the money. So we launched this six-year plan. We came up with it internally. We had it uh, reviewed by McKinsey, which is an outside consultant. We adjusted for McKinsey's plan and, um, you know, pushed some stuff beyond the six-year timeline. <clears throat> As of today, we launched in 2019. As of today, we've received 57% of the funding we should have received since 2019. So you'll say, well, then you must be, way, you must be, you know, what, 43% uh, behind. What we have to do, and every commissioner has always done, is take from, funds from less visible parts of the agency, move other things downstream, because we cannot fail to modernize, right? And we're behind where we want to be, but I have to tell you, some of the hurdles that collectively we've had to, we and people on the outside have had to cross during the pandemic could have been avoided if this agency was modernized 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Um, there, it, there are um, technologies that would have helped us tremendously during the pandemic. And unfortunately, a large portion of our technology budget goes for operations and maintenance basically the ability to keep the pumps running, to keep the lights on in the, in the tech side of the house. Let me also talk about the current budget for fiscal 22 that we got March 15. There's a lot of press saying, well, IRS got an extra $675 million. Isn't that amazing? They ought to really be able to turn a corner. Know that somewhere between three and 350 million of that, so about half of that extra, goes for basically what I'll loosely refer to as our cost of living adjustments. Um, you know, um, scheduled salary increases that happen, but also uh, with our contractors, everything goes up. So we didn't get that. We got 675 million, basically cut that in half. And the half is going to go to help fund projects that should have been done before I came on board almost four years ago. So it's a struggle. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California, Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. Ranked number one on the West Coast and number five nationwide, this innovative program prepares students to practice tax law at the highest level in the U.S. and abroad. Featuring a low student-to-faculty ratio, cutting-edge technology instruction, and dedicated career support, UCI's Graduate Tax Program helps prepare students for a future in tax law. Program graduates are placed in top tax-related industries, practicing law in many major U.S. cities. Applications are open now. For more information and to apply to this highly selective program, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. There have been a lot of proposals on this increased information reporting, and that inevitably is going to be an, a burden on the IRS, right? If you're getting in all of this additional information, um, how are you going to gather it? And then what are you going to do with it when you get it? Um, ha, what are your thoughts on that, um, on how the IRS is going to handle the prospect of increased information reporting, whether it's, it's from the American Rescue Plan of, of 2021 or some future legislation? Um, and does the IRS have the resources to do something with this additional information that it might acquire? 
So as you know, in the information reporting space, something like you know 99% where there's withholding and, and information reporting gets accurately reported. When you drop one of those lanes, it drops down considerably and it goes below 50% without information reporting. So from a tax administration perspective, information reporting itself is helpful. Uh, I was and am supportive of information reporting in the virtual currency space because we know if you look at the affidavits in the various John Doe summons cases in their public, um, if you look at the affidavits there, we know that information reporting and the receipt of information in the virtual currency space, uh, people are challenged. And I get it. Some people say, well, I don't know whether or how to report it. Uh, the questions that are there are there for a reason. You know, we asked straight up, did you have any such and such transaction? We moved it from, you know, three pages back to right under the signature line for a reason. Read into, when you see us move something from one part of a return to another, read into it that it has a lot of internal attention and know that every space on a tax return is, is, is um, you know, highly sought after. So when we take up space and we take up space on the first page, know that the IRS is focused in that arena. Look at those John Doe summonses and you will see that we know that there is underreporting in that arena. I'm not saying underpayment of tax, because we have to, we have to look. But I'm saying under reporting, so it comes back to um, uh, technology and funding to get us there. And the best example I can get is go back and look at the FATCA litigation. We got litigation to enact FATCA. We did not get, um, we got funding to enact FATCA, or excuse, legislation to enact FATCA. We did not get funding to implement FATCA in the terms of technology. So if you're wondering, well, IRS has all this FATCA information they've not been able to use, we're waiting for the funding, or we have to less visible to more visible, et cetera, type of a thing there. So information reporting, in my mind, in the virtual currency space would be very well received. We need funding for that. Otherwise, you're just building a bigger haystack to be out in the yard. And by itself, those haystacks are not impactful. Um, certainly, there's a deterrent effect anytime you have information reporting, but you know you don't burden people just to create a deterrent effect. You, 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 as much as it helps to get information reporting and maybe to open up some audits or this or that in certain spaces, it should also help us stay away from certain audits. And you mentioned uh, AI a few minutes ago. More than half of the audits uh, that are conducted in small business uh, are selected by AI. And as you go forward, I think within two or three years, it'll be 100% of the audits in the small business space will be selected by AI. And then you'll see AI continue to enhance. We have quite a few data scientists and analysts on board, and um, they're helping us know where to go. But I, I like to say, as importantly, they're helping us know not where to go, right? You, you can't fault us for opening some examinations. You can fault us for staying in that exam too long or ignoring the obvious, if you will. And I, I used to maybe make comments like that when I was representing taxpayers. But uh, you know that, that was my job, sort of to help the IRS understand what they're looking at if they don't. In that space, we need funding because we need to train our people. It's unfair for us to train our people, if you will, at a taxpayer expense. We need to go to the right place with the right people who are trained, who ask the right questions, who understand the answers. And if the right move is to get out of that audit, we need to get out early not just stay in it just because we happen to open that audit. So information reporting overall is a, is a big help for tax administration, but it needs to be channeled, it needs to be appropriate, and it's unfair to burden taxpayers in that space, particularly if it's space that the IRS um, can't use. So we need to get both pieces of that. We need to get legislation for information reporting. We need to get funding for the appropriate technology to be able to process that to tell us where to be and, and as importantly, where not to be. Well, I want to give you uh, a few minutes because I, I am actually very interested in what are you most proud of in your time um, that you've been at the IRS? So, you know, this is a unique agency. When I got on board, some people said it's, you know, tax collection, tax examination, and tax administration. Um, it's, you know, at po various points in time, data processing, data collection and all that. And I get it, you know, that people say that. And I was pretty familiar with the agency, probably knew 5,000 IRS employees, first name basis when I came on, um, all of whom, by the way, were frontline employees. I, I'm not sure I knew too many executives as they use the word around here, um, but I, I got it on the outside what's there. 
I'm proud to say that this is no longer a brick and mortar agency. This is a, a group of people who care about people. I'm hugely proud to be able to tell you that um, within a year or so, and, and hopefully less, the largest call center of any um, government agency will be located in Puerto Rico. Why did we get to Puerto Rico? Because they had two hurricanes, and this builds into the second part of this, two hurricanes and an earthquake. And I like to say the 20 somethings left Puerto Rico and they'll come back in 10 years when you know their parents' generations rebuild the island. Uh, we went in there with federal jobs, which are very highly uh, sought after and praised. And the first round, we looked for 500 people. We got 600 qualified applicants. A benefit, but not the sole reason that we went there is they tend to be bilingual, which in Spanish, which obviously helps if you have people on the phone that can they themselves handle something without going to the interpreter. And I will give you an example that the first group of uh, IRS folks from here who went down there um, came back to me. And the person who came back to me is a, a pretty much a tough guy and a former Navy SEAL and he comes in and he goes, sir, you're not gonna believe what you did down there. And I said, well, what did we do? I, Chuck doesn't do anything. This is a team effort. What did we do? And he says, well, a lady got a job. The average compensation there is 21,000 a year. She signed on with us. She got $31,000 uh, position with us. And she was crying and crying. And she asked if she could give me a hug. And I said, of course. And she said, you have changed my life. You have changed my children's lives and you have changed my parents' lives. And, you know, culturally, I hope my children understand that comment, but, you know, culturally, my wife's one of seven children, and those seven children in Vietnam were the social security package for her parents. Number two, and this is all part of what we call our Lifting Communities Up um, initiative, and I would hope to, at some point, see more written about this, if you will. Number two, Mississippi Delta. We are wholesale going into the Mississippi Delta, uh, Clarksdale and Greenville, Mississippi. Why are we going into the Mississippi Delta? Because when I look for positions, 2000 positions in Austin, Texas, 600 applicants, 100 qualified, and we're up against Amazon, we're up against Target paying $20 an hour, we're up against Amazon paying truck drivers $110,000 a year, and I need to bring people in at $15 an hour, it's not gonna be a successful venture. Mississippi Delta, how did we get there? We got there from the EITC heat map. There are more um, claims that we disallow in the Delta region than anywhere else in the country. So obviously that is, you know, the, the EITC is to help people into poverty and below levels and, and above, but people who qualify who are eligible. So we're going into the Delta with federal jobs. And how are you gonna do this? Lifting communities up. We paired up with two-year and four-year institutions down there. We brought, uh, we're bringing high school VITA into the high schools there so people understand giving back, people understand the IRS, and we're going to create a pipeline of skilled employees. This is probably a six or more year project, and we are just now getting off the ground, but it's a longer-term project for the IRS to go into communities that are uh, underserved, that are challenged, bring jobs in, skill the people in the communities, with a hope, right, that they are uh, they stay with us. But if they don't, we skill them up and they go somewhere else and bottom line is they're better off. So rather than maybe a data processing or a tax collection or whatnot agency, what I've given to the employees here is we are a group of people. And I just say it loosely, if you have a better word then I could say it shorter. We're a group of people who care about people, expect us to go into communities as a method going forward. We have six different places, which we're not gonna announce, but we have six different places around the country that are equivalent to where we are now in the Delta. And the best way I can describe um, what we've seen from facilities down there, we were offered a closed school. We were offered a closed hospital, a community that has a closed hospital, a community that has a, a closed school needs federal jobs in that community to help support the community. And I want you to be proud. This is the IRS. It's the people of the IRS. And, um, I might have opened that door, but I will tell you that our employees have passionately gone through that door. We go down there, we do a lot of different things, and everybody who comes back from there comes back from there energized to say, you know what, I work for the IRS. That's my team that's down there, and uh, I'm as proud. So I went over my two minutes, Cara, but you know, I want people in this country to understand in a broad uh, perspective 
of IRS is people who are working really hard, who have done their best to give you the services that you deserve, who know we have not been able to provide those services, but we are trending in a good direction, both for inventories, as well as I think skill sets and you know we need funding for the technology. And the last thing I'll say is we are hiring across the board. So, you know, that's right. It's a good so plug. We, I, I apologize for going over. Uh, no, I'm hugely, I, yeah, hugely thankful you. for the opportunity. Uh, no, I I think you have a lot uh, you have a lot to be proud of, and uh, and I really really enjoyed the conversation today. I've learned a lot. I learned things about the IRS that I didn't know. And I genuinely appreciate that you took the time today to come and talk to us. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. And, uh, and I look forward to uh, the next time that we get to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief, Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Eugene Sego and Edward Schnee examine the time and control tests for corporate division. Lee Shepard looks at the OECD's Pillar 2 proposal, commenting on the dubious potential for it to be administered. In TaxNet State, Martin Eisenstein and Jamie Zoll explain blockchain technologies and what makes state tax implications of them so novel yet so familiar. William Hayes Wiseman argues that because the U.S. Unemployment Benefits Model lacks the flexibility to accommodate mental health issues in the workplace, it may be time to reimagine the system. In Tax Notes International, five practitioners examine the taxation of ransom payments in Canada and the United States. Neil Pereira considers how the metaverse is changing the face of digital transactions and their taxation. In Featured Analysis, Carrie Brandon Elliott reviews the rules for assigning disregarded payments to foreign tax credit limitation income categories. On the opinions page, Marie Sapiri argues that the attempt by several states to enshrine an uncapped SALT deduction in federal law shows a confusion between state legislatures' political interests and state sovereign authority. And before we go, a special note. The submissions period for the Christopher E. Bergen Award for Excellence in Writing is now open. This annual award recognizes superior student writing on unsettled questions in tax law or policy. Eligible students must be enrolled in an accredited undergraduate or graduate program during the academic year. Submissions are due by June 30th. Visit taxnotes.com students for more details. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at taxstew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Support for this podcast is provided by the District of Columbia Bar. The District of Columbia Bar's tax community will hold its annual tax legislative and regulatory update virtual conference on May 4th and 5th, 2022. Register now to engage in timely panel discussions on hot topics, including legislative and regulatory updates on corporate, partnership, and individual taxation, tax-exempt reforms, international tax, including the latest OECD developments, taxation of financial products, compensation and benefits tax, and more. Speakers include high-profile government officials from Treasury and the IRS, as well as staff of the Congressional Tax Committees and private sector experts. The conference is virtual and open to all. DC Bar membership is not required to attend. Visit dcbar.org to register today. That's dcbar.org. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.